I have a phone. Oh, okay, I got it. Okay, we can't deny it now. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I'm happy with this. Uh, we'll get started on the next lecture in just a couple minutes. Um, beforehand, does anybody want to say anything about the last one or any specific uh, questions or directions or topics about the subconscious mind you want me to touch on during the lecture? I think I should start doing that at the beginning of these things. Oh, okay. I don't have my notes in front of me. I just started a note for this session, and I think I will try to keep more copious notes as we go along. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Now, Tom, your recording, does that mean that we can watch the recording later if we wanted to, you know, go yeah. back and test? Okay. Absolutely. And I try to post the links to that after the lectures inside the Shepherd's Dojo. Oh, okay. I, that probably was quite clear. Okay. Uh, if you scroll back, you'll be able to find them here and there, um, you'll need the link and then there's a password underneath it. And I try to right, right. it together. Oh, okay, yeah, I wrote that password down. I didn't know, so far we haven't needed for this, so that's later. So each video has its own password. Okay. So you find the link, you know, it's like a, a decryption key. And, okay. Uh, and once the series is over, which is going to be a while, probably about 30 total topics. Wow. Then we'll clean up all the data, um, condense it down, edit out all the filler, and then produce something that's a little bit more academic, oh, a little okay. bit more streamlined. Maybe even uh, do some simple animation behind it. Oh, cool. I don't know. I haven't decided yet what I want to do with it. Tony uh, actually had some ideas, and I was curious you know, what he, what his vision would be, because his excitement kind of got me interested. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm all about the people. My thing would just be do the same project again, make it 52 weeks, yeah. have at least a goal of five. Because in all of my journeys, these are um, general topics. That I think I could find five people to spend, you know, an hour a week with once, you know, a week oh, on. Try and grow the class size. For fun. Yeah. Or yeah. just do it again. I mean, first time self-reflection and then do it again before actual marketing or, you know, I mean, for me, that's where I'm at. Because remember, we talked a long time ago, not a long time ago, uh, about a week ago about the two roads or whatever. And um, when you say go back it up i feel like after we go back and clean it up then we'll see where it will best fit yeah i think you're right but right now it's still meshing and melding and we're both still in this i think for the core fun of it <laughs> well yeah it's just the the exercise itself is the goal right now and then uh once you have the results of the exercise given how much material is there you'd actually I could view it as a set of legos at that point you could break it down into its parts and build whatever you wanted out of it, really. Uh, potential is endless. All right, well, I guess I'll get started. Uh, the topic for today is the subconscious mind, which is actually my favorite mind to, uh, to spend time with because it, well, it knows things. So, one of the first lectures I talked about the different kinds of uh, consciousness that we have and uh, the science we've got right now says that uh, we're not one consciousness in our brains. Um, that's like the, the person that we are is an interaction of different consciousnesses and that's kind of how people are made and they can, they've measured this, they've measured this. So you've got your brain waves from your left hemisphere and your brain waves from your right hemisphere. And then you've got your neural uh, information from your, uh, like your brain stem and your, they call it your gut brain. And all of those things, uh, if you were to go down inside them, you'd be in like a self-contained little bubble that only could see at the edges of each of those different things. So they're, they're, they're lesser beings as it were, because well, they have to be, they're a part of you. So they have to be less by definition, because 
they weren't, well, then you'd have more than 100% inside you. And that's kind of weird. That's, that's not how it works. They can grow and change, but the total at any given moment is always 100% of you. And these different consciousnesses can be exercised like any other thing. You use it, develop it, it gets stronger. So some people, you'll notice that there, there's just a, a, a standard distribution of natural talent, just like everything else, just like basketball, running, jumping. There's some people, they just, they're born to it. They have talent, they understand it right away, and with very little practice, they become very good very quickly. And then you've got people who they just, for whatever reason, they're not wired for it. They could work really really hard and get kind of okay at it and they would never be able to catch the person who works hard and is talented and that's well maybe because they're not seven and a half feet tall they wouldn't win a slam dunk competition being five four regardless of how much they jump they just hit a wall a recent video a recent video i watched was about jordan peterson and his take on hard working fools or something similar like that yeah, well, I'll tell you what, a hardworking fool is, is probably my archetype. If I had to, to pick one. You say that about every archetype. Well, that's because I'm trying to collect them like Pokemon cards and be all of them. Exactly. Hayoka is defined as the wearer of infinite masks often. Yes. Um, seeing how they're all the same mask, I guess, is the is the goal for me is how are all of these different parts one thing so yeah the hardworking fool that's a good archetype um so anyways yes you've got some people who are talented some people who are not and this is spread out across as many different dimensions as you can imagine you've got height speed agility intelligence uh the ability to spin a basketball like you could take anything and if you drop it inside a group of people and it's brand new, some of them are going to get it fast. Some of them are going to be set up for success and some of them aren't. That's a different way of describing hierarchies. Okay. You've got your, your low 1% and your high 1%. That's just the way people shake out. That's nature. You find that everywhere in nature. And so I, I talk about that for the three different types of consciousness because scattered around uh, the world are all these different points of view and well where do they all come from now one of it is is we have too much information right we don't know what's relevant like i'm looking at twenty thousand things in this room alone that i could understand a hundred thousand ways for each one but only a very small percentage of those facts that i'm receiving right now that I don't even, I'm not even aware that I'm receiving are relevant. It doesn't matter that this little spring here has a, has a tension strength of whatever it takes to keep it attached to my hand. That's not relevant, not to this, but if I made these little clips for a living and I cared very much about them not falling off when people put expensive things on them and expect them not to fall. Well, then the tension force on this spring would be very relevant. And I might even take that knowledge with me everywhere I go. Now I'd see tension strength, tension strength at springs. And every once in a great while, maybe I would see something that's dangerous that nobody else sees because it's linked directly to this incredibly specific thing that is not relevant to anything that's happening around it in a way that most people understand. Well, that's kind of how the, the, the understanding of everything happens. You live your life, you're exposed to the things that you're exposed to, you gain familiarity, you learn the difference between relevant and irrelevant, and then through training, you're able to refine that to such a degree that you can instantly spot the difference in ways that are useful to you. So let's backtrack that back to where I was, to what I'm building. So the conscious mind, the subconscious mind, and the gut brain are examples of this. There are times where your conscious mind is more relevant 
than your subconscious mind or your gut brain. Like you're in an emergency situation. You're panicked. Your your heart's beating ten thousand, you know, beats a minute, and you, you feel like you're gonna hyperventilate. Your gut brain is not doing a good job being in charge right then. It's overwhelmed. All it knows is everything's a threat and I want to get out of here. So if your gut brain is in charge of that situation, well, you're rolling the dice. You could run, you could fight, and maybe you pick the right thing. But chances are it's a reaction and not a, a planned course of action. So, okay, well, fine. Well, maybe your conscious mind in that situation. Well, your conscious mind doesn't work by itself. That's your free will. That's your ability to compare things and to choose. It's also your logic. So depending on what you know, if you're in a panic situation, well, maybe that, maybe that is what you need, a calm, level-headed approach to this happens, means this happens, means this happens, and you can kind of plan your way out of your current predicament. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe you walk into a room and you get an uneasy feeling. And you trust that enough that you walk out of the room and it turns out later on something bad did happen in that room. Well, which was the best mind inside you to handle that? Well, it's hard to say because we don't know what's relevant and what's irrelevant. Sometimes it's a, it's a roll of the dice. Sometimes one answer is going to be the right one and sometimes a different answer is going to be the right one. So the point is there are enough situations that exist that regardless of which part of you is dominant between your gut brain, your conscious mind, and your subconscious mind, there are paths of stable success that have been found by other people who are talented and in tune with that way of thinking. So stability exists if you can find the specific difference between relevant and irrelevant from a specific point of view. Kind of like there's 20,000 wrong answers to a math question and maybe only two right ones. That's the difference. Sometimes the right answer is the right answer because you are looking for it, right? Like you decide what the right answer is first and then you say, how do I build it? And when you take that approach, your future is, is, is in your mind a fixed point. Now, your future isn't changing. Your future is very clearly vision. And you know that if I want to reach that point, you can't be anywhere else except that point and be considered a success. So the closer you get to that point in the future, if you're trying to get the thing you're after, the more limited your choices will become because that's your goal. Your goal is to eliminate everything that is not that until you reach your goal. So that's kind of, well, that's kind of the way everything works. So we've talked about the, the conscious mind last time and the different languages of logic. That's conscious mind is a language of perspective, okay? A uh, variable perspective. Um, and there's a lot that you can do with that. And we spent a lot of time covering that. Today, we're going to talk about the language of the subconscious mind specifically and, and kind of drill into that. So the first thing I'm gonna do is give it a definition. There's a lot of definitions out there for the subconscious mind and depending on who you read and who you listen to and what you study, well, you're gonna get a mix of, of neuroscience, you're gonna get philosophy, you're gonna get quantum mechanics, you're gonna get biology, you're gonna get the theory of evolution you're going to get uh, mysticism, you're going to get religion, you're going to get uh, spirituality. The, the subconscious mind, that's, it's, a it's a popular topic. And I can tell you, and I will tell you, why all of those different presentations of the subconscious mind, all of those different attempts to explain it, are the same thing. They have a core, um, they're the children of what the subconscious mind is. They're the progeny, they're the natural offspring of the nature of the subconscious mind. So all of the different things that you've heard about it, none of those things go away. 
Um, none of, not all of them are right. Obviously, if two people say the opposite thing is true, well, if they're not qualifying things and saying it's true here and it's not true there, if they say this is always true and another guy says this is always true, both of them are probably wrong because this is always true is very rarely a statement that that pans out to infinity. It's always this is always true if this is always true when like you have to tie it to something for it to, to have the way I think about that is the word need. People think okay. the word need isn't relative, but it is because life is not a necessity. No, no, you can die anytime. <laughs> Just because you're alive doesn't mean you need to. That is so encouraging. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I need to be alive to have this conversation, but that's it, right? <laughs> There's my it. That's my need. Um, so, Let's talk about the subconscious in more broad terms. So I found two things to be universally kind of fair game when I talk about the subconscious mind. And so this is kind of be the way I frame the conversation because there's other stuff and it's worth exploring, but all of it seems to tie to these two things. The first thing is the subconscious mind is everything you've ever seen or heard. Okay, it's your memory. Yeah. And it's more than just your memory. It's not like a digital archive where you can go in and replay your greatest hits. That's something the conscious mind does when it cooperates with the subconscious mind. It's a different thing. Your subconscious mind doesn't need the greatest hits. The subconscious mind is the greatest hits. Okay. That's the first thing. The subconscious mind is the remembered experience of everything you've encountered, which is why I think the internet is fantastic. Because if your consciousness grows by interaction and you increase the speed at which you can interact, it's like get more food, bigger food supply. So if your subconscious is everything you've ever been exposed to and you gain the ability to be exposed to more things in a way that doesn't make you insane, then over time, your storehouse of everything you've been exposed to will grow. So that's the first thing, the subconscious mind. I think that's true. I do. I think that's part of the nature of the subconscious is it's the things you've experienced. Also, the subconscious mind is your pattern recognition machine. Okay. So when I say pattern recognition machine, uh, that's intentionally vague because the scope at which the subconscious mind does this is broad okay so it has to be vague to cover everything because there's a lot there so when i talk about your pattern recognition machine okay that because it's a broad topic i can give you a bunch of different examples that look different but let's i'll just give you a few and then see if we can kind of make it make sense as it goes along because it's Kind of a tricky idea until, until you get the hang of it. So when I say the subconscious is a pattern recognition machine, that means that anytime something happens to you that isn't right, anytime something happens to you that doesn't sit well with you, or anytime something happens to you that makes you happy and sits very well with you, um, Let's say that I, uh, an example, I see that the, something more concrete, something more concrete. Okay, say that I'm watching a television show and it gets to the scene with the high speed car chase. All right, so now I go from looking at my phone and listening to the dialogue about two people who are trying to use their family bond to overcome a lack of funds, fuel, and to pull one up over on the man by having this high speed car chase. Well, all of that filters around, but I really don't care to watch that. But maybe I'm taking that in and doing something else. But the car chase, well, now you've got my attention. There's fast machines and everything's moving around and maybe some explosions and some gunfire. Well, that's interesting. Why? Why is that interesting? Everybody was nodding. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's the good part. Well, it's your pattern recognition machine. Okay. 
And in this specific instance, you're curious, maybe even a little excited. Um, or maybe you've got an aversion to car chases and that scares you. Or you've had PTSD uh, with, with some sort of explosion in a vehicle and, and hearing explosions next to a, a vehicle actually triggers a flashback. All of those things are tied around the same thing, the car chase. So how are all of those different things the same thing? There's a pattern behind it. So if you have a thing and you have multiple people who can view that thing differently, it's not that this person is right and this person is wrong. It's that if this person can take what this person knows and add to it what this person knows, this person knows more than either of those two people before that exchange happened. Um, it, it's more of the more perspectives that you can gain, the more you can understand the nature of a thing. So let me break down the car chase. The car chase is something that we can easily recognize as a threat against life and safety. It's dangerous. Now, a race car driver might watch that and he would be excited because he knows how to drive a race car. He would be looking at all the things. Yep, I understand that. Yep, that's what you do. Oh, that director doesn't know what he's talking about. That would flip your car over. And he's watching this thing and he's going through all of the, the pacings, no pun intended, for his own survival. And he's come away with this excited thing because when he places himself in that situation, it's fine. The person who, uh, let's say, comes back from a war and was through an IED, and they see an explosion next to a car. Same thing. Survival mechanism is tested, except this person isn't sitting in his living room. This person actually can transport their mind back to the real world where there is no Hollywood budget or bond of family brothers that's overcoming the government and the man and, and all your stuff is great. Uh, and you have complete information before you go into the, the final scene of the movie. This is real. And that guy's recognizes all of these different things and says, well, that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong and that's wrong. And so it's just this flood of bad information that he's seeing. He's like, no, this is totally nonsense. And it would make him apprehensive. And all of this happens in a split second. It's not like people are watching TV with notepads and going, well, this makes me hungry. And that means I'm trying to off put my survival there. And well, that woman's attractive and I, I, I definitely want to take that quality that she has and merge that. With, no, none of that happens. <laughs> that's too complex. Um, and that's not the language of the subconscious mind. Uh, that's the language of the conscious mind. Language of the conscious mind is slow and it's verbose. So as you get deeper, the language gets trickier. And when I say trickier, it gets more compact because there's more information. It gets compressed like a zip file. I don't think those are a thing anymore. We just made storage bigger. We didn't worry about compression. <laughs> there's still a thing. Whatever so, you download from Google Drive, yeah, it downloads it in a zip file and you have to extract it if it's a folder or a big file. I think that's training an AI to do the same thing. But anyways, I digress. Um, so yeah, that's the compression. So we talk about the language of the subconscious. First, I'm going to tell you about the mouth of the subconscious because it speaks. Okay, it speaks in a language that is weird. There's two things about the subconscious mind's presentation of information. Is one, the, the, the subconscious mind doesn't understand positive and negative. That is a concept of the conscious mind, either or, yes and no, if and then. The subconscious mind does not work that way. The subconscious mind is yes and no, if and then, this and that, which means the subconscious mind goes back to one of the things I talked about in the last episode, uh, the, the self-defeating nature of axioms, okay? That's a different way of saying that you can understand the thing and put it in a bubble 
And if you know exactly what that bubble is made out of, you know everything that is inside the bubble, you know what the bubble is, and everything that is outside of the bubble. That's kind of how we understand everything. And so you're always going to reach the boundary. So the subconscious mind understands this intrinsically because it's a pattern recognition machine. Meaning if I, it, it, it's the game, uh, oh, what the devil was the name of that game? War games, war games, where the, the kid ends up challenging the computer to play global nuclear thermal war. And he can't teach the machine like to stop the countdown. I mean, it's gonna blow up the world and it teaches the, 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 the computer to play tic-tac-toe. And the computer plays a million rounds of tic-tac-toe and then the computer figures out you can't win the game by playing it that way. And it realizes the game is flawed. Uh, the rules are, are, are not understood properly. That's what happens in the conscious mind when we don't have what's relevant and what's irrelevant. We, we had incomplete information and we say, well, if I turn on, if I push this button, hot water comes out. Okay, great. And you push that button a hundred times and hot water comes out a hundred times. Well, maybe that's a good idea. But what happens when you push the button one time and cold water comes out. Well, then what? Well, there's a perfectly reasonable explanation behind all of that that would be capable of being understood if somebody went beyond the initial relevant information, which is I push this button and hot water comes out. So what the subconscious mind does is it's not satisfied with the answer. It's satisfied with understanding what built the answer. It is, your, it is your axiom generation machine, your subconscious mind. So that's its function. Uh, it tries to understand stability within irrelevant, unstable information. So that's kind of the core of the subconscious. That's what we're going to talk about it as, as your memory and your ability to recognize patterns. And I'm going to talk about patterns in a way that is a little bit different than maybe uh, maybe, maybe you've covered before. Um, I'm just going to try and look for something here easy that I can point to. Uh, here we go. Here's one kind of pattern. So this here is a little vial of uh, beads that I use for art. OK, so if I look at this cylinder here, and I have all these beads inside it, and I give this a really good tap. There's a volume inside here and a shape of every one of these beads. And I could come up with a math formula, it would be complicated, that describes the position of each of these beads, all right? And if I dropped these beads a thousand times and measured that math formula of how they fall in here, and I study all these beads, well, I would notice a different pattern. Even though I'm focused on beads, I would also be studying gravity. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even know it. I don't care about gravity or why. I just, the beads, right? I care about the beads. But your subconscious notices that. They fall. Why do they fall? I don't know. And it ponders that and ponders that until maybe it hooks you hard enough that you're sitting under a tree and you say, this is just driving me crazy. I got to write down the math for why things fall. And then you become Isaac Newton. And then you become uh, Albert Einstein, who reads Isaac Newton and says, well, that's not everything. It doesn't work all the way. This guy didn't get it right all the way. So I got to keep going. So anyways, that's about the, the different kinds of pattern recognition. So let's talk about, about what that means when I say pattern recognition. The ability to find a pattern where there is none. That's a that's a, a phenomenon. They have a name for that, pareidolia or something like that, something close to that. The ability to, it's like when you look at a doorknob and you see a face, okay? You fill in the blanks. Um, sometimes you do that with nonsense and you try to create relevance from irrelevance. And that happens a lot. 
okay? And we do it on purpose, it's fun, it's a game. Uh, what can we make that looks like another thing? It's an association game. Um, that's because that's engaging our pattern detection centers. Like, oh, I know how to make patterns, here's one. But what about when stuff gets just seemingly totally chaotic or contradictory or paradoxical? Um, my point is that the subconscious mind has the ability to process patterns that would make you cry if you tried to write them down with your conscious mind. Um, the, its ability to pull from everything because that's what it does. It could combine something you heard while you're having breakfast with something you read 10 years ago with the final piece of information that's been missing for 10 years, which is what that person just said to you right now that had nothing to do with what you're thinking about. But all of those things click together a puzzle that was being worked in the background. And finally, the big pattern pops out. And then you go, oh, that's how it is. Really? You maybe even doubt it. Like, and then that, that's kind of uh, what, uh, let's see, good, uh, a clean example in the conscious mind of that. Let's talk about uh, love and hate. Okay. Love and hate are the same thing. I don't mean that the extremes of that same thing are the same thing. They're different. Love is one extreme. Hate is another extreme of the same thing, which is, a, uh, which is just a, a level of affection towards a specific person, place, thing, or object. So you talk to somebody and say, I just hate them so much. How far away are you from loving them so much? How many things would need to change? Is it a lot or a little? Sometimes it's just a few things. Oh, if that person just wouldn't do that one thing, it drives me crazy. Apathy is worse than hate when you're talking about how much a person matters to you. Exactly. If you hate someone, at least you give a damn a little bit. You give a damn enough to be upset. Now, love is different. Maybe you love so much that you don't give a damn who gets hurt. As long as you get what you want, because you love it so much. Love and hate. It's all attachment. And so your subconscious mind might not, your conscious mind might not understand that. Like, man, I just love this person. I love them so much. Why don't they notice me? Why am I so invisible? Why can't I make friends? Why can't I be desirable? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? Why can't I do that? You're loving that person so much that you're hating everything you think they don't like about yourself. That's what's happening. Your love is hate in that circumstance. But because you can't recognize it, you only see the part that's good or the part that you like, or the part that you care about, going in one direction that you think it should go, the piece of information that's missing is everything. Almost everything that I've seen without exception behaves in the, in the sense of equal and opposite reaction. That's one of the laws of the universe. And that's not saying a thing is. All that's saying is if one thing moves, it's pulling things with it. You can't move a thing without it changing other things. That's, that's just, a a, call it a truism. I don't know. I hate truisms. I hate axioms because most of the time they're bullshit. But the ability to make a separation, that seems to be like a good one. So I'm going to keep that one. I can't break that one yet. So your conscious mind is struggling with this example, this love-hate example how you have so much love to give and you hate yourself so much for not being able to do it that your equal and opposite reactions are canceling each other out because you don't see that you are generating the opposite reaction right next to the equal reaction and they're canceling out. But your subconscious mind sees that. Subconscious mind sees that very clearly because 
Why? It's a pattern of behavior. You are, you are giving the subconscious mind the one thing it needs to figure out a pattern, which is repeated exposure. Things that don't make sense eventually make sense when the data is there. That's how the subconscious mind works. It's like, uh, it's like that game on, uh, I can't remember the game show. It was, it, was a, it was a game where they would slowly reveal a picture by removing little squares. And you could buzz in when you saw, when you could guess what the full picture was, even though you didn't have all of it. That's what repeated exposure is to the subconscious mind. There's a canvas and your subconscious mind can be like relevant, irrelevant, here, there. Um, your subconscious mind actually is like a house of infinite drawers. I'm gonna point to these drawers over here if I can. My camera work is terrible. Okay, there we go, I got some drawers over here. A house of infinite drawers. And you might take the same piece of information and that same piece of information could be copied a thousand times and placed into a thousand different drawers because each of those different drawers is a specific kind of relevance. Say that, uh, say that I have a box and this is my only possession in the universe. And all of my problems, I have to figure out how to solve using this box. Well, if I need to put stuff in something, that's an easy one. If I need to hit someone over the head, well, this corner might do a pretty good job if I'm careful about not breaking the box. If I built the box strong enough, I can stand on it. Uh, if I need to hold something down, which if it's my only thing in the universe, I don't know what I'd be holding down, but fine, I could put this on top of it. The point is that this single object now has infinitely variable relevance. It can be anything I need it to be if I know what it needs to be. And as long as I don't break any of the rules, like if I say that I need to fly to Mars, this box isn't gonna help me. Ah. Made out of wood, it would burn up. <laughs> There's no oxygen, it's not airtight. I, I get cold. Uh, the vacuum of space, gamma radiation from the sun, all, all of these things, this box isn't going to be relevant to that. But that doesn't remove all of the other equally relevant things that I understood about this box a moment ago. So your subconscious mind is kind of like a storage facility that's got, that, that's got multiple copies of the same information sorted by relevance. And uh, we come across, we came across this term in a previous lecture called superposition. That's a quantum thing. That means that uh, superposition comes from the Schrodinger experiment where the cat is alive and dead. It's a probability thing. You can't understand what is going to happen in the future until you reach the future because there's uncertainty. It could be this, it could be that, it could be this, it could be this, it could be this. A marble statue is a statue. You can go back in time to a point where that marble statue was a block of marble instead. And at that point, before that marble block has been carved, it can be any statue that would fit inside it. So in that state, that marble block has a superposition quality, which means it could be a giant cat, it could be a sphinx, it could be a dude holding a sword, it could be uh, a weather vane. It could be a, a bear. All of these things are equally possible if the craftsman chooses that form for the, the finished thing. So that's the way that information is stored in our brains. It's a state of superposition, state of potential. It could be this until it needs to be that. And the greater you can, and that, that's a muscle. So that's the, the language of the subconscious. So we talk about natural talent. Some people, that just, that, that's a duck to water, that, that kind of thinking. This thing can be anything. You know? There's a few people that get there naturally uh, by accident. They're autistic people, okay? They struggle with relevance. So if you were a creature with, a, with, a, with an ability to evolve, and learn and grow so you don't die. 
um, and you were faced with a world of, of irrelevant information. One of the ways that you could, uh, one of the ways you could evolve or grow to combat that situation is to increase your ability to separate how many different kinds of relevance you can put to one object. So that would be how you would overcome that. You would say, I don't know what's relevant or irrelevant. So let me learn about the rules of relevance in general. And then your weakness becomes a strength because you develop going through these things so often that you create a much bigger catalog than most people would normally have of equal skill. Why? Because they don't need a bigger catalog to function in the world. They get it, at least the stuff that keeps you alive and happy. But there's more there. Uh, do you want me to come over today? Joseph's got uh, got some friends coming over today. That'd be nice. Yeah. Or he's going somewhere. That'd be cool too. I, I can't go nowhere. I'm stuck here for tomorrow. Um, so those people, then if you can get the missing piece by chasing it that way, well, now guess what? You've trained a weak area to a level of competence that is either average or even above average because you overcompensated and really wanted to make sure you had it right. But now you have a tool that the other person doesn't who got there by accident. You put in so much more work, you have so much more data, your ability to use what you have grows. So that's kind of one way that that's where you see the difference between autistic people who are geniuses yeah. And autistic people who who can't get a job at a supermarket. There's there's a line. There's a line. Some people can overcome it. Some people have access. I'm just doing an experiment where I want to see what I do all day. What's up, Joseph? Determine what I want to do for her. Oh yeah, yeah, Joe. I'm gonna mute you here, buddy. If you're not trying to chat here, I just wanna. I have uh, attention things, so I get kicked out of my mental race car pretty easily. So I gotta keep that. But if you need to uh, to get unmuted to say something, just use one of the emojis and I'll I'll, uh, I'll give you the floor. Obviously anyone here can speak if they want to. Um, so yeah, let's talk about uh, oh, what was that? the mental, uh, okay, so yeah, the autistics. Yeah, the ability to see or not see what is relevant. You create variable relevance, okay? Um, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. You've got your, uh, let's talk about your stoic mystics, like your, your Buddhist guys at the top of the mountain who can meditate and, and bring peace to the world and harmony and at least to their mind and all that and let go of all attachments. So what those people have done is they have an aversion to irrelevance, okay? They know what's relevant so much that being exposed to, air quote, irrelevant things causes discomfort. And so what do they do? Well, the natural response to discomfort is to try and get out of it. So they study all of the things that bombard them with irrelevance, in their words. They study meditation. Now my mind just won't be quiet with all this irrelevant stuff. So what do you do? You learn how to turn your mind off. Well, that's good if you need to turn your mind off for something specific. I got to interject. Hey. I got to interject. Are you going to opinion my opinion? Go ahead. Well, 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 the thing is, I saw a video maybe two to three months ago now, and it really helped because it put into words a, a very strong quote that um that my mind had been wrestling with about meditation okay. and it said that being calm is the least productive thing meditation can do so when you're over here talking about like oh they meditate to be calm and blah 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 i'm just like you can't you meditate. taking meditation advice from like yeah that's the first step but i mean yeah so i just had to interject a little yes. bit that's all no that's one that's one relevance that is one relevance of a variable relevance that I'm gonna, yes, keep building. So yeah, there is a correct way to use meditation, but this is not talking about right or wrong ways to use meditation. We're talking about the ways people do use meditation. So of these many variable subgroups, some of them 
are going to get to the, the part that is going to be after this. I'm covering the people who do it wrong right now. I cover the people who do it in a way that's counterproductive, meaning the autistic who can't learn to separate relevance from irrelevance. Well, they're just going to be miserable. Why? Because nothing's ever going to make sense. And if the answer is never, how do I get things to make sense? That's not going to change. So that's 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 the, 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 the one possible ending to that setup. Or like the other story, the autistic who learns, well, there's more patterns here than I recognized. And if I could spend enough time wrestling with these patterns, I can make some sense of this chaos that gives me trouble, at least enough to get me out of this bad feeling that I have where nothing makes sense, or I'm being bombarded with things that I don't know how they're relevant. So in both of those cases, it's a fear response. Okay, fine. What is that? What do I mean by a fear response? I just mean something is uncomfortable and I don't like it. So it's maybe not a, a, a grand level terror, but it's enough that if you were standing next to it and you had somewhere that was a little different and felt better that you would just naturally go there. And all of our lives are this subtle dance where I don't like it there. Maybe I want to be here. Nope, here. What about here? No, that was worse. Okay, this is better, but it's not. What about here? Okay. Well, this is better. What's special about where I'm at now? Well, there's a whole new problem. So now I got to do this. And you just get this intricate dance where now maybe it's not that I have to be here or there. It's I need to be here and then move here and then circle around here and then step. And as long as I do that, well, I notice, well, nothing bad happened that whole time. You learn uh, these intricate dances and those become your routines. In life. Oh, it's going to be cold outside. You, you didn't have a good coat. So you went outside, you suffered. And then it rained. You really suffered. So what do you do? You go home and now you got choices. If you never go out because you're an introvert, you tell yourself, no, I'm never doing that again. And you stay inside. That's one way. Great. Now you don't have to worry about the rain. It's true. A bunch of other stuff happens, but the rain is handled. The rain and the cold are done. Or maybe you don't have a choice. So you go buy a, a warmer coat. Well, now if your warmer coat shows up, you're better prepared for that environment. And every time you go out and it's not cold, you're happy. And every time you do go out and it's cold, but your jacket keeps you warm, you're also happy. Why? Because you were able to avoid the discomfort. Your whole life got centered around that one little spot of discomfort and you ironed it out. So that's the small scale stuff. So let's talk about how this, uh, <laughs> how all of this gets mixed into our everyday perceptions here, because that's kind of the, the meat and potatoes of the, the language of the subconscious. I haven't talked about the language of the subconscious. I was still just defining it as a, as a concept, but I think we've done that. Your, your subconscious is best thought of as a conscious entity, okay? It's a conscious entity with goals. Its goal is to keep itself alive, which means it has to keep you alive because you're it, okay? You keep the brain running. You give it food. You keep it alive. It's got to protect you. So how does, it do, how does it do that? Well, it can only do a few things. It can remember, and it can find out patterns. So let's say that your subconscious mind is a brilliant tactician and it figures out everything you need to understand to be happy. It, gives, it, it knows the grand happiness equation. And maybe it does, at least at that moment, because for most people, happiness is defined as how to do things in a way that doesn't make me miserable. How to not be next to things bad that happen that make me uncomfortable? How do I be calm and happy? That's most of the time the goal of the subconscious because when you're calm and happy, you're not in danger. At least assuming that you are perceptive enough to have that state of mind correctly. Let's say that you are. Let's say you're aware enough to know when you should be frightened and when you can be calm. That's fair enough. At least that describes enough people that I'm not 
making stuff up that could never happen. So it has all these great ideas. Well, how does it tell you? Well, that's a good question. And there's a couple answers to that. But let's talk about what happens. Uh, let, let's assume that it tries to tell you because it does. And I'll show you how in just a little bit. Say that you try to talk to somebody and you're trying to help them and they hate you or they don't listen to you or every time you tell them something, they tell you the opposite or every time you tell them something, they do the opposite or every time you have a suggestion, they work against you with their utmost skill or rather than listen to you, they engage in self-destructive behavior to prove just how much they don't need to listen to you. Imagine that person. How long would you keep that person in your life if you were the well-intentioned one who was trying to, to bridge that 18 gap? years. 18 years. That's the legal limit. That's all I got to do, buddy. 18 that years. Good. That works good for kids. Years. That works good for kids. But what if you're trapped in a room with that person? <laughs> you kick their ass. <laughs> it, what do they say about two people in a room? Uh, let's, let's call it a man and a woman. There's an old phrase. If there's a man and a woman in a room for long enough, they'll either have sex or they'll kill each other. Yeah. That's what they say. So I hate to, to be the guy that says this, but that's what most of us do all the time to our subconscious mind. Constantly. Constantly. Why? Well, shoot the messenger. That's why. The subconscious mind recognizes all of your self-destructive patterns. It recognizes that when you yell at somebody and they yell back at you and you yell back at them again, you make your social circle smaller and your overall survival becomes weaker. That's a fact. It might not be in a way that impacts you. It might not be relevant, but it is undeniable that creating an alliance with another human being that is bonded with trust to the point where that human being will go out of their way to help you when you need it. That makes your survival chances go up and it boosts your quality of life too, if you can pull it off. So your subconscious mind gives you a hint. Now we're gonna talk about communication, the messenger itself. Subconscious mind doesn't understand that you don't understand uh, duality. Okay, there's a disconnect in language subconscious mind this is all half it obviously is this from the subconscious mind's perspective and it sees this helpless creature you who is making all the decisions your conscious mind and fucking up undeniably in ways that are very avoidable um and i use the the self-destructive personality responses as an example so say that uh Let's use a, an example people can connect with. Say that, say that I go somewhere and uh, I see something that bothers me, okay? Uh, something bothers me enough that I wanna do something about it because it's not right and I think it's gonna be bad if it continues. That's, that's relatable, okay? You can put that in a bunch of different circumstances. And I go to that situation and I've got choices for how I try to handle that situation. And there are a number of answers that will leave that specific situation handled from the benevolent to homicidal murder and everything in between. There is a list of solutions that will end that specific point in the way that you think is better than the way it is now. Okay, great. Problem is, if you're looking at that specific point, if you remember, when you move that point, you move other things. That's, that's just the nature of the universe. There is nothing that exists on its own. 
everything pulls. So the direction that you move that point actually matters. It's relevant. And if one can't see the relevance of moving the point correctly, as opposed to just moving it, they will move it in ways that do not give the desired result when they think it should. Um, and that sets off your pattern detection. Your subconscious goes, no, you idiot. I'm gonna make you feel terrible. I'm gonna make you hate that guy. Why? Because before you didn't care about him. That's important. That is important. Okay, and people misread this cue from the subconscious mind all the time with negative emotion. Let's say that uh, the example that I was using is somebody, somebody beat their kid in front of you in a way that was borderline. And you don't know if it was discipline that went a little too far or if it's something where maybe the authorities need to get involved. So you step in. You yell at that person in public. Oh, you dress them down. What kind of person are you to hit a kid like that? What, what's the matter with you? What kind of monster are you? You feel pretty good too, because everybody around you is doing this. Yeah, yeah, that person's a monster. Well, guess what? That kid is going to get beat 10 times as hard when you go home. You're not going to see it. And it was your fault. Because if you had done nothing, it would have gotten worse. So why do you hate that person? That's the question. And what are you supposed to do with that? Well, I hated that person. I did what you told me. My body made me hate you. And I treated you like I hated you. And your subconscious mind is like, no, dummy. I didn't make you hate that person because you're supposed to act that way. I made you hate that person because you're supposed to understand there's something relevant here that you don't understand. And if you can figure it out, you will increase your odds of survival because the next time that pattern gets in your way, you won't get run over by it. So I'm gonna step back from my analogy and kind of create this as a, as a meta, a higher like rule, et cetera, as a, as a generalization. Anytime you feel by accident, um, meaning you have a reactionary emotion that you didn't create on purpose, okay? Anytime that happens, your subconscious mind is communicating with you to pay attention to the thing that you're focused on. There is something there. And it doesn't mean what the feeling says it does. Meaning that's our reaction to the feeling. That's our incomplete perspective of the feeling. Just because you feel angry doesn't mean you should act angry. It means you should pay attention. Just because you love something doesn't mean you should love it. It means you should pay attention. Because there's one question behind every emotion that will help you make contact with your subconscious mind in a way that can eventually develop into conversation and that it's not an exaggeration, okay? <coughs> I say language on purpose and the, the language of the subconscious is chemical. And there's, there's a rule of consciousness um, and it's kind of the rule of, of everything. Whoever's bigger wins. Okay. And what I mean by that is the same thing I mean when I say that certain people have different perspectives naturally. Some people, their conscious mind is more developed. Some people, their subconscious mind is more developed. Some people, their amygdala is in charge of everything. And uh, <coughs> so the stronger consciousness wins. I see that, uh, Joseph. Oh, not Joseph. I see that, uh, Tony. Um, the subconscious mind can kick the ass and fully cooperate with your body's chemical threat detection systems, your, your, your gut brain. Okay. 
Your subconscious mind is a pattern recognition machine. Your body behaves predictably and it knows how to manipulate what you remember and produce specific feelings. So that's a good question, Joseph. And that's, I'm gonna get to that. I'm gonna get to that. So I'll use this one example and then we'll, we'll see if it ties in. <coughs> um, so your subconscious mind learns early on how to hijack slash use slash integrate your body's chemical systems to help you. Okay, it's a communication technique. It's, you don't understand anything except what you run into as a conscious mind. You need to decide things. If then, greater than, less than, forward, backwards, etc. So the subconscious mind needs to figure out how to communicate with you in a way that is attempting to explain two sides of an issue using a one-sided signal. It's a challenge. So the best it can do is make you interested or, uh, and I can break that down further. There's, there's a list. It's your amygdala reactions, fight, flight, feeding, and mating. And I touch on that a lot because that's where bedrock seems to be. If I run from it, if I'm scared of it and I want to run from it, that means there's something about that that challenges my survival. You know to run from it. How? Your subconscious mind has the pattern figured out. So anytime you meet something that you want to run from, you have the answer. If you can ignore the message, uh, the, the first contact, as it were, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a traumatizing thing because the subconscious mind can use your chemical threat detection systems to communicate with you, but you still use them to react to everything else. So if you have this terrible fear tied to something and your subconscious mind sends you a message linked to that something, you'll get the message. But whenever you try to think about that thing, you've still got your own terrible fear to overcome. So you're going to say, no, I'm going to go over here because that terrible fear is too much. So then what happens? You run into the situation again. Well, the, you didn't do anything about it and the fear didn't change. So you, you do this. What happens when the fear gets a little bigger? Or somebody new comes working in your office and they give you a hard time or they, uh, you know, any number of things, any number of things. All of these things happen. And if they're not, addressed directly, then they don't go anywhere. And you're stuck with an uncompleted pattern and your subconscious mind, well, it, it, it doesn't, uh, how should I put this? It doesn't know how to do anything more than you do. It's not omniscient. Hey guys, I'm gonna say we're gonna stop the side chatter between the chats. I don't like where it's going and it's a distraction for me because it pops up and I, the content of it's not related. Let's just save that for side chats, please. Because uh, Joseph is someone daughter. I've been trying to help. I'll be back with yeah. that side chats, guys. And then, uh, yeah, just for, just for the lecture because it distracts me and I lose my frame of mind. Um, so. Uh, after the lectures will be a good time to ask questions. So take notes. We'll do a, a Q and A at the end. Um, I'll read what I can, but I get I get knocked off too easy. It's my fault. So don't take any of that on yourself. It's me not being able to function. I guess as a as a professional lecture person. Um, but anyways, the language of the subconscious is chemical, it's emotional. So anytime you feel an emotion. There's a pattern there, a pattern you understand is relevant, but you don't consciously understand. So what do you do with that? Um, there's only, there's a couple of tricks, I guess, is the way that I can describe it, because the language of the subconscious is, it's not like I can get you a, um, a dictionary of, 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 of vocabulary. The dictionary is the amygdala, okay? There's eight words. There's 
fighting in the positive sense, fighting in the negative sense. There's running in the positive sense and running in the negative sense. There's feeding in the positive direction and feeding in the negative direction. And there's mating in the positive direction and mating in the negative direction. Those are the, those, that's the vocabulary of the subconscious. Those are the words it has to speak with you. So what you're left with is blink once for yes, twice for no sort of uh, communication. And I'm telling you this, your subconscious mind is a thing you can address directly. It's a one-way conversation at first within your conscious mind. It's like having a conversation with yourself. Um, and I'll give you an example of that, uh, a great example here like from my personal life. So I'm walking along and I notice that, this is a true story, by the way. I notice that my field of vision is very narrow, generally. I'm always focused on one thing that thing. And I don't see anything around me. And so what do I do when I need to notice a lot of things? Well, I would look here, look there, look there, look there, and always everything would be hyper-focused. Okay. So I became interested, curious, which was my feeding language. I wanted to consume more. I wanted to bring more into myself. So I had a desire to explore this topic and gather more data. And so I said, so what do I do? Well, let's see what happens if I try to focus on two things that are next to each other as one thing. Okay, great. So I practice that and it's hard and it doesn't make sense because I'm not used to it, but it's all perspective. And I do this. And then eventually I say, well, that's kind of getting easier. What if I do this with 10 people in a room? Now, what if I do this with a whole room? How do you walk into a room and just kind of see everything? You practice. That's how. Um, and so I do all of this, and I do all of this, and I do all of this, and I don't question it. And I'll tell you why I don't question it a little bit later. Uh, the short answer is trust. I don't question this curiosity. And finally, I realize the pattern that I didn't understand was I had a fear of transition. Fear might be a strong word. Um, it's not the wrong word, uh, but there's different flavors of fear that can kind of make it a little bit more relatable. Um, I grew up with an uncertain house. I grew up where the same answer on a different day gave you different results. The, the literal definition of uncertainty. Uh, things could change in a moment's notice. So when things changed, it usually wasn't good, especially if I was feeling comfortable and things changed. Then it really wasn't good because I was already where I wanted to be. Anything that wasn't where I wanted to be could only be trouble. But there I was. I'm this tall and I don't have any words and, or any muscle really either. So I'm, I'm there. Yeah, I'm in the middle of it. So I just learned by pattern at a young age, I need to be scared when things change. And that's my conscious mind that learns that. Every time I remember things changing, it's not good. I get that bad feeling associated with it. So, so then what? So I look at this problem, this fear of transition, and I say, well, what does this actually touch? What am I missing? What is stunted because of this? And the answer that I have was a lot. Because people communicate emotions as a language of their changing state. And I can't watch that. Not as it happens. I can jump in the moment it's done. That's way less scary. Watching somebody's mind go from, or somebody's face go from calm to angry. You can look at a calm face. You can look at an angry face, but watching a calm face transform into an angry face. That's how emotions work. That's how emotional language works. That's how emotional awareness works. You have to observe the change. 
people are not these static things in the moment. But growing up, I only wanted static things because anytime something changed, it was bad. So I just like snapshot, 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 snapshot. And guess what? I can't tell what's relevant from what's irrelevant. Why? Because I'm not paying attention to everything that links it together. The transition. So because I noticed and was curious that I can only look at this much of the world at a time, enough that I wanted to look at this much and this much and this much and this much at the same time, I was able to find out that the larger pattern that I was missing was that I didn't like to watch things change. And that gives you a new set of clues. Okay, so this is how the language of the subconscious mind works. A thing happens and you react to it or you don't react. Okay, let's say it's one of the things you do react to. A thing changes and it makes me more curious. Well, now what the heck is going on there? I thought I already figured that out. Now I've got another question. So what do you do? You chase it. Why? And that's where I have to get a little bit more honest. All right, cool. Um, that's why I, have to, I get a little bit more honest. And that's where I get the insight from my childhood. I didn't land at my childhood from the fear of transition. The fear of transition was just like, wow, let me check all that. Yeah, every time something changes. I don't like it. And that's, that's a puzzle, it's curious. So there's another message from the subconscious. Yes, you're curious. You need to ask why. Well, because some bad stuff happened to me when I grew up. Well, now I'm uncomfortable. I got bad memories associated with that. So now I'm scared, maybe some anxiety. Another message from the subconscious. So it's not, don't think about that. It's Yes, you're on the right track. Keep it up. Do it again. Okay, why am I uncomfortable? And everything that I've found, for the most part, seems to dead end at the amygdala, the fight or flight. You're, you're, uh, you're feeding your mating. All of it goes back. And there are different ways that you can slice that up. And there's ways that you can go deeper into that. But if you're looking just to take something with you that can help you practically, then I can boil it down into a one, one, excuse me, one piece of advice. Whenever you feel a thing by accident, you need to ask why until you're satisfied that you have hit fight, flight, feeding, or mating in a way that doesn't leave you with more questions. That's the language of the subconscious. The language of the subconscious is I'm going to make you feel a thing by accident. And if you're smart enough, you'll figure out why that happened. Because guess what? Feeling things by accident is traumatic. You change. And you didn't mean to. If you're lucky or smart, you're surrounded by things that make you change for the better. And you really don't mind that much. But if you're not, you're dumb, self-destructive, or unlucky, or all three, then you're going to take that same information and it's, it's not going to help. So... That's the language of the subconscious. Let's talk about making contact, okay? So yeah, it's great. Uh, I could have all this stuff, but how do you say hello? Well, your subconscious mind is ahead of you on that. It's already learned how to make contact with you, so that's good. If neither one of you knew how to make contact at all, then you have twice as big of a problem. So there's already a language that exists that you can borrow from. So how does it start? I'll tell you how it started for me. Uh, I think that there's a lot of paths that you could uh, take 
to make contact with your subconscious mind. And I'm not trying to give this a mystical, this is not the like monkly at one with the universe. This is not a hokey, spiritual, ethereal, sort of vibey, intangible, whatever you want it to be concept. This is not, this is a concrete, if then A plus B equals C to get reproducible results method. Okay, so that's the first part is, number one, you have to believe that. Okay, your subconscious mind is a personality. I said that earlier and it's true. It's true because if you treat it like garbage, it won't help you any more than is absolutely necessary. And it'll punish you. Why? Because pain makes you change. I feel miserable when this happens. Why? You're being punished. Why? Because you're doing it wrong. Ouch. Might still be true. <laughs> but ouch. And that's for me. Like, you can't argue with you. So what do you do? Well, if you're some people, you blame everyone else. Even though all of your reality is created inside your own mind and nobody puts anything there. And everything that is in there is the byproduct of you interacting with yourself and of that. We still have the ability to put other people and give them the power to inject our state of mind. Well, if you believe that's true, it's going to work that way. And your subconscious mind is going to make you feel like crap every time it goes wrong. Why? Because it's bad for your survival not to think for yourself. It's bad for your survival to treat other people like they're in charge of your mind. It's bad for your survival to destroy relationships or to avoid making them. Why? Because your world is small. What happens when your world is small? You have less resources. You have less everything. Okay, so that's kind of the, the why behind that. So making contact, the first step, and this is the most critical step. You have to believe it's possible. And it has nothing to do with faith. And everything to do with, if you walked into another room and wanted to talk to a person in that room, you have to give that person the time of day. And if you want anything good to happen, you should give them some respect. But they're gonna tell you to go fuck off. And your subconscious mind is no different. And your subconscious mind has access to your body's chemical systems and it can make you hurt for saying no. It's bigger than you. And your feelings are bigger than you too, because they power everything. So that is why you have to believe it's possible first. It's not because faith creates it. It's because you won't be able to see the subconscious mind until the chip is off your shoulder that makes you believe you're the smartest thing in your own brain. It's, it's like the equivalent of a kid who runs into some play space says, I'm Superman, I'm going to take all these Lincoln logs and throw them around. And then the parent says, well, you know, you could build a little house with those. And then the kid says, no, and he kicks the Lincoln log cabin and starts throwing them at other kids. And so what do you do with that kid? Well, if it's your kid, maybe you discipline him or you don't, you're a bad parent. Uh, or if it's someone else's kid, probably what you do is make sure the other kid isn't going to hurt anybody keep the other kids away from him enough and then let that kid be someone else's problem. Now that's what your subconscious mind will do to you. If you come in with the attitude that uh, you're not real, you don't matter. I'm in charge. It will treat you like an enemy. If you treat it like an enemy, that's the first rule of the subconscious mind. It's, it's like you. And if someone came up to you and started treating you bad for no reason, you'd understand that response. So it's equal and opposite. You just have to be aware of it when it's happening in you. You can be a bastard to yourself. And if you are a bastard to yourself, you will punish yourself for doing that. You'll suffer twice. So that's the first part of making contact. You have to believe it's possible. If I haven't convinced you that's necessary, then nothing will. So you're on your own after that. If you don't get past this step and it doesn't work, it's your fault. Uh, so you have to believe it's possible. That's number one. 
Number two, it's gonna take some time. Why? Because you're teaching a language. Okay, languages aren't, uh, languages are only as simple as what they can say. And most of us, the language with the subconscious goes as far as ouch or hey. Uh, it's not very useful. It's useful in a very small number of ways, and we do our best with that. So the first thing you have to do is explore the vocabulary and try to expand it with nuance. How does that mean? Well, let's break it down. Start focusing on things that make you feel by accident. Just be aware. Uh, look for patterns in what you feel. And I'll give you some shortcuts. Things that you admire in people. That's a good list. What do you admire about them? Great. Another useful list. What do you hate about other people? What makes you disgusted? What makes you curious? All of these things. And the, the reaction can be this big or the reaction can be this big. And the difference is both of those are useful. The reactions that are this big means there is a lot that you don't understand. The bigger the reaction, the bigger the gap of knowledge. Okay, that's the red alarm. Like, if I don't understand that people will hate me if I yell at them all the time, that's going to make a big reaction in me. Especially if I don't understand why they hate me. Maybe I think I'm the greatest guy in the world and I just don't understand that yelling is not a good way to communicate. I don't, I'm oblivious to that fact. Let's say that's true. And I keep doing that and I keep doing that and I keep doing that. My life is going to get so messed up. And then what? I'm going to go and say, why is my life so messed up? Why isn't this working? Why isn't that working? Why isn't that working? Why? And the more I hurt about why things aren't turning out the way that I think they should is how big of a gap there is in understanding between what the subconscious mind is trying to point out to me as important and what I understand. So while it might be exciting to focus on the big questions first because they're the loudest, they're also the hardest. Why don't you start? So if you're gonna start making contact with the subconscious language, Start with your shared vocabulary and expand that little by little. Let's say that, uh, here's an example. I'm just gonna watch your guys' eyes light up and see what happens when I show this. So this is one of my copper trees. So Nancy has a smile, Tony has a smile and a nod. And both of you, that was instant. And I would say, well, let, let's let's turn this into a class exercise. Nancy, why does this tree make you smile? The the intricacy of the love put into it. Tony, what about you? Because you're proud of it. Okay, so let's talk about that. It's two wildly different answers, right? Wildly different answers. But both of you had the same response. Mm-hmm. So notice that you took the limited language of your subconscious was able to communicate to you two completely different meanings. And if Nancy explained to Tony her reasons for this, Tony could probably understand it. And if Tony explained his reasons for why pride is a good thing, Nancy would probably understand it. But both of you would have that and both of that would be tied to the same thing. So. Now I would ask the questions. So if this was Tom and I had saw that and I had that same reaction, that begins a process for me of deconstruction. So I'm gonna pretend to be, uh, I'm gonna pretend to be Tony because that one is a little bit more uh, accessible to my mind state for this moment here. So I look at this and I see pride. So if I am proud of this, I would say, why am I proud of it? And then I look at it. Why am I proud of this thing? Well, it was hard. It took planning and it looks beautiful. Okay, well, that's, that's another answer, but that's just another emotional response. Like I've shifted the problem. I haven't addressed it. 
I maybe understand the problem a little bit more because now I know that it circles here, but that doesn't give me a pattern yet. So, okay, so then you're gonna get used to this question, why? Why do I think it's beautiful? Well, that's a harder question. So then I look at it. And if I'm answering that question, it's beautiful to me because it takes all of these little individual pieces that are nothing on their own. They're uniform and indistinguishable from one another. And it makes them cooperate in such a way that they produce this stable object. And so for me, this becomes a metaphor for cooperation and starting with nothing. Why? Because the wire was nothing. It was free. It was garbage. It was given to me. And I took that garbage and I turned it into something beautiful. So now I say, so why does that make me so satisfied? Why does that give me pride? Well, here's the answer. I have an advantage when it comes to turning trash into things, meaning I can find value where others find garbage. That's a survival thing. That's a feeding thing. That's a, uh, that's technically, that's a fighting mechanism. If you want to get down to it, I can take this garbage and, and, and make it useful. Uh, they have a fairy tale that touches on that, Rumpelstiltskin. Mm -hmm. Spinning straw into gold. Taking crap and making it valuable. Well, now I understand. So now, well, that seems a little bit more fundamental. I like having things that are valuable, and I like to be the one that does that. Okay, why? Well, because that makes me feel powerful. It gives me choices. It gives me free will. It, it gives me utility. It gives me X. It gives me X. It gives me X. It makes me a more dangerous is the wrong word, but it makes me a more capable human being to be able to do that. So if I'm dangerous and capable, well, now I don't have to be afraid as much. And now I've reached bedrock from my perspective. I think that's beautiful because I think that there's a pattern that's shown in there that teaches me that through competence, you can make your fear go away. Okay. Now, if I were to take that from Tony's perspective, uh, well, let, let's use a different example because I don't want to muddle this one. That was a clean example. So we're going to step away from that one. So let's talk about admiration. That's a, that's an easy one to, uh, well, we did admiration, but I'll do one more for admiration because this is where the trickier messages hide, okay? And when I say trickier messages, the delivery is the same. The subconscious mind does not change the delivery method. It's always accidental emotion, okay? It's always reaction. But our willingness to listen to the message changes based on if that's a good emotion or a bad emotion. Why? Because we're drug addicts when it comes to our brains. Why? Because the drugs make us feel good serotonin and dopamine. And what happens if we don't have enough of those all the time? Well, it gets so bad that we get doctors to put us on pills to give it to us. Why? Because it's miserable to not live in that state of mind. So we're seek, we seek that. <laughs> That's how the brain tells us we got it right. Hey, you feel good. You're here. Good enough. Um, but if something happens and you feel good about it, doesn't mean you understand it. And that process can go terribly, terribly wrong. Let's say, for example, that you're, uh, I don't know, you watch somebody and they're super talented at music. Okay. They're, the stuff they can do with music just blows your mind away. And you have this incredible respect for their work ethic or their, their creativity or their genius. You feel good about that or at least curious, admiration. So you don't dive into that. You just, when you leave this person, the admiration goes away. And when we come back to this person, the admiration comes back. So you like the admiration part of it. You like the good feeling part of it. But all of that is inside you. It's generated from you. It's generated from your perception of this person, all of it. So. When you go next to this person, that person is not giving you anything beyond whatever interactions they make that bounce off of whatever you understand, but that's all you creating 
the bouncing and the interaction as well, because they could say one thing, you could misunderstand it. You could even understand the words wrong and get something useful. And it doesn't matter because that's inside your brain. So the thing is that admiration, you don't just need to go next to that person to get your fix. There's a pattern there. What does that person have? That person has an incredible ear for music. That person has put the time in or has the talent to separate frequency by listening to it. That person can make a collection of chaotic things come together harmoniously. That's what's behind that skill. And your subconscious knows that, and maybe you do too. So the admiration isn't from what that person can do so much as it is a response to something you wish you could do. And what you do with that response determines what happens. You could say, I'll never do that. And maybe you're right. Maybe you're not going to be 400 pounds and eight feet tall and be able to play for the Miami Heat next to Kobe forever. You know, maybe, maybe you won't be in the NBA with a 50% free throw percentage. Well, you look at that guy and say, okay, maybe that one's out of my reach. But what about that guy who has his life together or girl who has his life together and uh, they've got a good marriage and a kid and a happy life and a stable job and a, a median income, I don't know, and they're not starving and their heat stays on every month. If you're poor, you would admire that. Why? Because that's better for you. If you're poor and you admire that and you don't think that you could do that, well, then your subconscious mind is going to punish you. No, you idiot. Yes, this pattern is true. All of this stuff that you see is true and that person still has it. And you're a creature of infinite potential and you could make choices that would confound the everyday man. And if you could think about those choices in, in the right way and put small choices together, you could end today better than you started it. And if you could figure out how to end today better than you started it enough times in a row, eventually you will have that or something close to it. And so maybe that admiration isn't what they have. I mean, there might be envy with what they have, but the admiration is their ability to do everything during the day that makes that happen. So that's another good example of how looking up to something might give you a hit of dopamine or a warm, fuzzy feeling, but it won't help you. And it's kind of like, like, like saying that, here's a silly example, a silly example. It's like somebody's showing you a picture of 10 cats because those 10 cats somehow have spelled out an equation that unlocks a mystery of the universe. And if you look at those cats in the right way, you get it. And it's there, and let's say it's there, let's, it's real, it's, it's real, it's a message, it's a hidden message, but it's in plain sight. And you look at that picture and you go, oh, cats, <laughs> look at all those cats. I wonder if I had a laser beam right now. And your <laughs> subconscious mind is gonna be like, no, you fool, like, look, look here. No, no, don't look at the cats, look at that thing. But you're too busy feeling good about yourself. And there's nothing wrong with feeling good about yourself. It's catching yourself when you're doing it by accident. If you're gonna feel good about something, feel good about it on purpose. Um, or at least understand why you feel good about it. You only have to do that one time, by the way. You figure it out one time and it makes sense for the rest of your life. The only danger is you might figure out you were being a jackass somehow and have to change something. That's gonna hurt. Why? Well, nobody likes to say I was wrong. Nobody likes to say I screwed up. Nobody likes to say I was the architect of my own demise. Nobody likes to say I am the source and the solution to all of my problems when it comes down to it because I might have a bunch of reasons why, but when I'm dead, none of those reasons will matter and my life will be whatever it was. And the only person who will care is the person who died because everything they are is inside their own brain. So 
that's kind of the where that can end. It's, it's if you don't explore it, nobody's going to stop you. There's no warning uh, system that says, are you doing a good thing or a bad thing? It's you get what you get and the choices that you make are yours and where you end up, that's it. So that's kind of the making contact with the language of the subconscious mind. Um, I've just got a couple minutes left. I'm gonna tell you how far this goes. And this will be the part that, that I enjoy from this, the benefit. So you do all this work. You do all this hard soul searching. You figure out where your feelings come from. And you trace those things all the way back down to the bedrock. And you start unraveling all that shit that happened in your childhood or that person that was mean to you on the playground that put a phobia in you that you don't even recognize or, or maybe that person that cut you off in traffic and made you just so angry. And you figure out all that stuff. Well, you and your subconscious mind now are on the same page. And guess what? By learning all of those patterns, what you have done is taught yourself the language of your own subconscious mind. You've learned a language. And what happens when you learn that language is you can start to use it, which means your subconscious mind has control over your body's emotions. It does that through language and memory. You remember a thing and you remember exactly why it makes you feel that way, which of your core things it touches. That memory plus that understanding equals emotion. So what do you do? You learn how to create your own emotions on purpose. Great. Because you know what else happens when you learn how to create your own emotions on purpose? You learn how to deconstruct your emotions on purpose. And you still get to have them by accident. So nothing that you were is lost, but you gain the ability to interact with it a lot deeper. And I'm going to close with this because this kind of, uh, this is fringe stuff here, okay? This is stuff for uh, folks with autism, okay? Folks who are at the very edge of, of, of being useless because they can't understand what's relevant at all, okay? The hair's difference between that eccentric genius and that babbling incoherent. Here's the difference. I'm going to feel that suspense because my throat is dry. I've said this before and I believe it. Anything that people do by accident, we can learn how to do on purpose. And there's an oddly specific application of that perspective that is very interesting to me. And that is schizophrenia. Or let's, people get hung up on words all the time for whatever reason. Let's go to the meaning. Meaning people who have personalities in them. There's different ways of schizophrenia. That's used to be a definition. My mom had some of that. Um, there's voices in your head, okay? And that's not dissimilar from thinking. You are a voice inside your own head, okay? And a lot of those things are made up of memories. So you can remember a voice in your head. You can remember a person so well that you almost think they're standing next to you. So the schizophrenic, they can't separate that from, they can't not do that by accident. There's a, there's a hardware thing. The connection that makes that possible in your brain is flipped in the on position for those people. And they don't have the mechanisms or the therapy or the perspective or a lot of things, which may or may not be possible for them to have to fix that. So what that means is if you study people with multiple personality disorders, they all seek the same thing, which is integration, right? I want my 10 personalities to become one personality that doesn't kick my ass all the time and take over my body. Well, we've documented that. There's 10 distinct personalities in a person. Sometimes it's 100. And that person has access to languages they never learned. Uh, stories they, they, they can't explain. All of these things where they've come into contact with it at some point in their life, but it's just a wash. But somehow their subconscious mind has, or their mind in general, has been hardwired to distill these memories into self-contained collections of knowledge that behave with personality. 
And that's why people's bodies change when they switch personalities is the language doesn't change of how that information is communicated. It's all amygdala. So yeah, one person could have high blood pressure. Why? Because they're, they're anxious. And this other person could have a low heart rate and steady breathing. Why? Because they're calm. So I talk about multiple personality disorder from that direction because these people are split on accident and they can learn to integrate. Well, integration is not a problem for most people. We do it by accident. We have all these different things floating around. That's, that's our normal life. But what you can do, and I, I'm not going to say this is not without risk. So unless you're as crazy as I am, you don't have to decide what that means. You can pursue an emotion so hard that it will split off and get its own voice. And I don't mean that in the sense that it becomes this tyrant. I don't mean that in the sense that you've destabilized your brain. I don't mean that in the sense that you've created some sort of alter ego, psychopathic thing that's gonna make you black. I don't mean any of that. What I mean is that you can build a constructed personality and remember that constructed personality so hard and wrap around that constructed personality, a system of emotions or emotional rules. And that becomes a stable state that your, that your mind can access. And the way I did that was when I did the mental street fighters club, I was exploring, unlocking my own emotions. And that was the exercise I used, which was a version of screen therapy. My goal was how intense, how angry it was angry. I was channeling. I didn't know it at the time. I thought it was intensity. Uh, how angry can I be while still being fully in control of my rational mind? And so that was the exercise. And so what, how did I practice that? I started shouting. I shouted while I was doing an incredibly analytical psychological exercise, which was moderating a debate between two people like it was a wrestling match. And after I practiced that for a little while, this character, like anyone who's done acting knows you can get caught up in a character and caught up in the moment, right? Oh, I was just in the right frame of mind. Actors do this all the time. Um, after a while, that character becomes solidified enough that you can access them without being them. You can remember them. You can remember what they are like. And because you're the one that created them, you can fill in any gap at any time so that that person has 100% of your knowledge and a very set perspective of emotion that you've decided ahead of time. And so what I've done with that is over time, because it takes me time to build these emotions that powerfully. Some people who just slip in and out of it naturally. Some people get stuck there uh, because they have a mental illness, but if you do it on purpose, you can build this thing. And when it's stable, now you have this like, I don't know, I, I, I like to think of them as like little advisors. And Carl Jung, um, don't look at me like I'm crazy. Carl Jung did this. It's just an imaginative exercise. It's an advanced imaginative exercise where you make a subpersonality that you can have a conversation with because it thinks different than you. And the only reason it thinks different than you is because you programmed it to have responses that you normally wouldn't have, but because you were self-reflective enough to figure out what you don't normally do, you're able to write a little program that says, you're always gonna do this, 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 and this. So that announcer character that I was talking about, what does he have to do? Be angry, be angry and honest. Yep, this is all just kind of the last little bit. So Tony, it's fine, you're not gonna miss much. Be angry and honest. And that character doesn't lie to me. So now, now I'm in a situation that's got nothing to do with anything. And I don't know what to do as Tom, right? I don't have a, I don't have a clue. So what do I do? Well, sometimes I'll go through this little Rolodex of characters that I've made. I've got a few of them. One of them is my anger and my honest anger. One of them is my self-doubt. My self-recrimination, okay? 
how dare you think you know that? That's one of my personalities. Uh, that's my tester character from the It Me Kingdoms Philosophy Monsters. The question. Uh, another one is, I've watched enough Jordan. You can do this with people too, by the way. As long as you recognize that what you're doing is creating imperfect copies that serve a function, you can put a face on it that you recognize and integrate that into your life. Um, I did that with Jordan Peterson. I've listened to probably 40 hours of his lectures, okay? He's got like 10 key points that he always circles around. And so I know those points well enough because I was interested in them. So I make the Jordan Peterson little memory in my brain. And he's the guy that pops up when I'm doing things I shouldn't do and I know I shouldn't be doing them because he always says that. Here's a great example. We had this thing where the cats would poop outside the box. They're right on the mat too. It's not like a, a big thing. You take it up, you put it in the box. But you walk by the cat room and you see a poop on the floor and you are on your way to do something. Now maybe that poop can stay there for a while. <coughs> Except if you know anything about cats, that's a terrible idea because now you're going to create a pooping war because I have multiple cats. <laughs> so you can't do that even though you want to. But I still don't want to. So what did I do? I did something easy. I walked by and I just had this little Jordan Peterson voice in my head that's now trained to come on. Why don't you just go pick up the damn poop already? Stop making such a big deal about it. Get on with your life. And so I'll walk by and all this is internal and it's in my imagination. And I smile. I say, oh, you know what? Me, I'm right. Let me go do this thing. Because really it was never about how difficult or easy it was to pick up the cat poop. It was about me being frustrated that I wanted to do something else and life happened in front of me and I wasn't ready to deal with it. And so I did something minor but self-destructive, which was ignore the problem, which anyone who studied science and entropy knows that makes it worse. So that's one of the applications. Uh, and then here's a fun one and I'll close with this one. Uh, my guitar coach is Jimi Hendrix. So when I play guitar, I know there's things I need to work on when I practice. I don't focus. I don't pay attention to what I'm doing uh, when it comes to the details. I like to just kind of go crazy and don't watch. I go too fast. That happens too. So I don't pay attention when I do things good. I don't get excited when things go right either. There's apathy in my playing. I don't pay attention to the transitions because I have a phobia of transition. So I don't watch what I'm doing. I do it and I listen and I go by feel. All of this is bad for learning how to play an instrument quickly. So all I've done is set up a checklist in my brain of if part of me recognizes this is happening, I've got a small part of my voice set aside to comment. Hey, that's pretty good. Most of the time, it's just you need to chill out. Chill, man. That's what he says. Chill. You know the sound I like. Going way too hard at this. Let's just ease it back a little bit, brother. And I start to do these own little de-escalation thought routines where, because I've learned how to map my emotions this way, and I know that this type of voice will help ease that transition, I imagine somebody saying that to me. So I made my own life coach. Why? Because I don't know how to do it myself yet, and I'm learning. And this is part of the process. I create a thing inside me that can do what I can't. I give it the power that I'm not ready to accept that I already have. And I listen to it. And that's kind of everything that ties back to the, uh, the, the hobby here, or the, the, hobby, the, the lecture here about the language of the subconscious. Is the language of the subconscious is just, it tries to help you. And it can do a lot. And it remembers everything you know. Uh, let's see. So now, actually, I am at the point where I can take questions. How come people won't get to the point about pursuing friendship? Um, I, I couldn't read the last bit, but I can go into the chat. Get to the point about pursuing friendship. Won't get to the point about pursuing friendship. Uh, there is something unique about me. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. So I'm trying to figure out how to deconstruct that question uh, in, a, in a way that I understand it. 
but I know what you're looking for. Um, and I want to make sure that the, the, the grammar was, was right too. So it's about goals. That's the first thing is understanding goals. So you have a clear goal, Joseph, and that's to make friends. That's not an uncommon goal, by the way. That is the single, so there's the thing right there. Oh, they, I got it, I got it. There is something unique about me. Yes, the unique thing about you is that you think that you're unique. That no one can understand what you're going through. That you have a singular perspective that has never been mimicked in all of humanity. And maybe the flavor of that perspective hasn't been mimicked in all of humanity. But guess what? The amygdala has been reproduced billions of times. And how you feel about your place is how other people have felt exactly. The same intensity. So that's the first truth. That's the first truth is that your presentation of reality might be unique, but the feelings you have about how you are interacted with are not. So that's the first thing. Um, how come everyone's not like everyone else? That's a that's a, the short answer is that our species would die. There's diversity, there's strength in diversity. So it's kind of like some of us get, we get different starting hands when it comes to perception. Things we're going to notice, things we're not going to notice. Sometimes your brain is cranked up to 200% and sometimes your body is cranked up to 200%. And sometimes your empathy is cranked up to 200%. Each one of those people is going to have different understanding. Everyone has a cross to bear. Yeah, that's a good one. So yes, it's one thing to recognize how heavy your cross is. It is a delusion to think that your cross matters more than anyone else to them. Their cross matters more to them. Your cross matters to you. So if you have a cross that is, uh, let, let's say that most of these crosses though are similar in size and shape if the cross is the feelings, right? Nobody's complaining about a truth. Everybody complains about how the truth makes them feel. One way, whatever that truth is. People don't care about the thing as much as they care about how they feel about the thing. That's fair. And if everybody has access to the same feelings, then what you can do is recognize that is a connection, right? You desire connection. And I say, Everybody desires connection in one way or another. Even people that hate other people. They don't hate other people. They hate how other people make them feel. And whenever those people who hate other people find someone that doesn't disgust them, they really like that person. That's true. You've seen that. And some people are so, I don't know, hate-filled that they... Uh, no, they don't like anybody and that includes himself and what happens to those people well they die miserable it doesn't always have to be a happy ending that's the other part to this that gets people tripped up you can fail you can waste your whole life and your only value will be as a cautionary tale to other people that's true and it should be terrifying because the stakes are high it's your life and if you don't value it, like it matters, nobody's going to value it for you. And the way that people understand that you value your own life is you show them you understand how to value theirs. At least in a way that communicates your communication with your subconscious mind. So guess what? You want to be admirable to other people. You want them to be attracted to you. Learn how to do the thing that their subconscious mind will recognize as valuable, which is learn how to communicate with it. Those are the people that you look at. They're the national figures, like your Keanu Reeves, your, your Mr. Rogers, your Bob Rosses. Okay, these guys were incredibly intuitive when it came to connecting with other people. And we recognize that to such a degree that we idolize them and put them where everybody can see them. 
and we point to them and say, that guy right there, what does that person have? They understand how their emotions communicate with their mind. They understand it so well that when they see somebody else having a struggle, they've figured out, they can understand that. So um, does everyone have an intuition about something? I would say, sure. Yeah, there's a million kinds of intuition and there's a million kinds of something. And <clears throat> intuitions can be hints, right? Like you're not omniscient, but you might have an idea the right direction. Uh, if I gotta go west, I could use the sun. I might not get exactly where I'm going, but I'll be going kind of in the right direction. And maybe when I get closer, I can ask someone for better directions, but at least I'll know I'll be in the ballpark. So that's kind of where I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, I'm a little bit over, so I'm gonna gonna wrap that up here. Um, but yeah, everybody is subjectively unique and objectively the same, at least when it comes to their potential. So let's end with that incomplete statement that could be torn apart a bunch of different ways because most of what I say actually doesn't exist as a complete statement, but as a collection of little web-like things, so it doesn't destabilize itself. But you get the point. Um, we had one question from Joseph, um, and I can follow up with anybody individually after this, but what about you, Nancy? Any questions from today's lecture? Not a question. I just, I wrote, I got to put my glasses on to see what I even wrote. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the variable relevant, relevance, um, I wrote offense and defense, but then under that, the neutrality, and we can't just sit there and be neutral. It's so one of the other. With Mike Tyson? Pardon me? Are you familiar with Mike Tyson? Oh, you know I'm a fighter, right? Yeah, of course. So what does Mike Tyson believe about offense and defense? Actually, I don't know much about what he said, but I know what I learned in, you know, I'm a black belt and I fought full contact. You can't be neutral. You're going to get your ass kicked if you're neutral. I had to either be defensive or offensive and I was successful <laughs> and uh, but the neutrality you can't stagnate in neutrality in life you have to be on the offense or the defense and successful at both so that's very good and I'll give you a truth a partial truth that I've built because this ties on to something um half having half of a truth is better than having none of it mm -hmm. that's 100 percent true yes. and if let's say that offense and defense are your only two choices or nothing which is neutrality so right. i have nothing i'm neutral and somebody comes at me and if my only option is nothing now i'm gonna get my ass kicked because i don't fight or defend Let's say that I become an offensive specialist, but I don't learn a single move of defense. But I become so good at offense that it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Absolutely. I, I've seen out. fighters like that. That person's knocked out cold every time. Great. What happens if somebody gets me? Now they get me. Yeah. But that person who is great at offense is vastly superior to the person who's neutral. You can okay. take that in the other direction. Say that you focus on defense to such a degree that you become an Aikido master where people can come at you as much as they want and they're always left disoriented, confused, and unharmed. That's your level of defense. Yeah. Now, that's better than neutrality as well. Yes. But let's talk about what Mike Tyson believed. Uh, one of the things I was interested in was fighting. Uh, there's a few fighters who believe this, but Mike Tyson's the most recognizable. Offense and defense are the same thing, is what Mike Tyson believed. If I am dodging, I can be attacking. He was yeah. a master of footwork. Absolutely. Look, all of your footwork that is defensive, which is movement, also has roots in offensive combination. And so what he worked on doing extensively was to learn how to move, number one, and how to recognize what his movement was and which 
fighting offensive move would pair with it. So none of his momentum was wasted. That was what the, uh, right. the pitch okay. was, was a variation of the Dempsey role, which was done by Jack Dempsey, where he did much the same thing. It was offensive defense. He made a figure eight with his head, so he would move. Right, right, right. As he would dodge, now he's got all of his energy stored up. So as he dodges, he's got half of a punch thrown. Right. So my point is that when you're looking at a thing that looks binary, oftentimes when it's either or, life follows a, a much better rule of improv comedy, which is yes and, okay? Either or, offense or defense. Offense and defense. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Which, which to me is the, the, and the greatest fighters actually learn how to integrate. Absolutely. The two so that they're not seen as separate concepts. It's viewing them as separate concepts that get you in trouble. Um, let's see here. Uh, the, the, how old am I? I'm 38. Going on 39. I think your issue is not personal if you catch my drift. I think most of our issues that trouble us are personal in some way that we can't recognize. And if we're smart enough, we'll find things that will help us. And if we care enough about fixing things that we think are wrong, I think that's that's really the the number one ingredient. So I could go on for another ten hours. So I'm gonna not. Uh, thanks for your participation. Um, one thing before you go. Yeah. Okay. You know I'm 71 years old. I saw Jimi Hendrix multiple times. Oh really? Oh yeah. We lived. Awesome. My dad worked in Hollywood, so I saw him at the Hollywood Bowl, <laughs> the Forum, other venues. Yeah. What do you think of my guitar playing then? I love it. What's yeah, I, I watched the videos. But yeah, uh, Hendrix, oh my God, what a a showman. I mean, I mean it was a Jimi Hendrix experience. There was three of them. But you know. Um, I guess then, yeah, Joseph. Well, I'll, I'll be around to chat too. Uh, I would say that anything that you learn about yourself or think about yourself, you shouldn't take any more personally than is honest. If it makes you feel bad, ask yourself if it's true. Mm, good. Or if you're being fair, uh, use yes and. If, if I had to give people homework in two words, it would be to look at life this week, uh, specifically in terms of anything that you think is either or. If you want to get in touch with your subconscious language, forget either or. Forget can and can't. Forget paradox. Ask yourself what plus what equals the answer not what without equals the answer that's a silly way to start a math equation i don't know what the answer is but i'm going to say this part isn't it oh what about hypothetically you can put it there and make it a value of zero you can test it as a value of zero but put it in the damn equation <laughs> test it out maybe it is the opposite of the thing maybe it is the thing that you say that it can't be Maybe that's the right answer. Maybe you don't think it's the right answer because that makes you feel bad. And so you figure out every answer that's not the right answer because why? That answer makes you feel bad. Well, why does that answer make you feel bad? Guess what? Now you're talking to your subconscious. <laughs> and how do you do that? You focus on the thing that makes you feel bad. There you go. Anyways, thanks for watching. This was fun. All right, All right guys. Do it again next week if I can uh, keep this up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Have a good Bye. Day. Thanks.